All right, guys, we are live. It's episode 282 of the Shooter's Mindset. Thank you guys for tuning in tonight. Joining me, co-host Greg Cannon's in the house. What's going on, Greg? Hey, everyone. Uh, Jennifer Seymour is joining us. What's going on, Jen? Hey, everybody. Uh, star guest of the hour. He is the current king of the two mile. It's Paul Phillips. What's going on, Paul? What's up, guys? It's a very calm, cool, and collective hello, Paul. We'll loosen you up here. I know I was kind of quiet throughout the pre-show, but you usually get going when the live button hits. And I got guns and stuff falling behind my computer. <laughs> um, but we're going to kick this one off here. Show sponsors. Uh, we don't have any for 2020. If you guys are interested in sponsoring the Shooter's Mindset, you can always hit us up on the social medias. Uh, you can email me, the shooters mindset at gmail.com. We'll get, we'll gather your email, exchange some information and see if you want to help out, support us. Um, questions. If you're watching here throughout the live uh, Facebook feed on the shooters mindset, you can get your live questions in. If you're listening over in the podcast, be sure to join us every Tuesday, 9 PM Eastern, where you can join the live show and get your questions in throughout that show. Um, other than that, think we're good oh shooters mindset.com obviously follow us everything shooters mindset at shooters mindset.com check it out um but for those who aren't familiar with you paul tell us a little bit more about yourself kind of what got you involved in competitive shooting as a whole oh boy uh i went in the marine corps in 86 to 92 i was in a scout sniper platoon that kind of sparked my interest in long-range shooting um, when i got out of the marine corps when i was going to college I met some local friends here in Midland, uh, Ray Gross and John Droley, and they kind of, you know, they invited me to go to shoot a couple matches, and I did pretty well, and uh, kind of sparked my interest to do, much, you know, further. So I started shooting uh, Palma and across the course NRA and long range championships. Did that for I don't know five or ten years, and then uh, I got into the the F class, which is the 308 with the bipod and rear rest. And did uh, three different cycles with the U.S. rifle team, wrecked up three world championships and, oh, geez, 11 national titles, a whole bunch of records, and did, I had a lot of fun. I was very fortunate to be around a lot of good guys that taught me a lot about loading and teamwork and reading the wind and spotting and just all the elements that go into long-range shooting. Well, then uh, in the third cycle, we were getting ready to go to the world championships in 2017. And it was a you know, 2016, Brian Litz and Mitch Fitzpatrick uh, wanted me to go spot for them out in 2016 at King of Two Mile. It was brand new. It just started in 2015. And I thought, wow, that sounds like a lot of fun, you know, to, you know, take the yardages out farther even. So we went and we won it. Uh, I coached uh, Brian and Mitch both. And I think, I think the highlight of that year was we had cold bore shots back to back at 2,470 some yards with two different rifles. So we had two different formulas, two different solutions, two different bullets, two different wind drifts, back to back, cold board a mile and a half. Well, that kind of hooked me. You know, that really was like, wow, that's pretty cool stuff. And, uh, you know, it was a new exciting thing. You know, we were shooting a mile and a half and farther. So then we went, went ahead and won another championship with uh, Derek Rogers and myself and Emil in 17, that was on TV. We did a little TV program, King of Two, King of Two Mile TV show. That's actually still on YouTube. You can Google that and watch 13 seasons. And that's very uh, educational. You can watch what people are using, watch how they're doing things and communicating with each other. And then uh, in 18, I took third. Uh, Robert Brantley tore it up. Uh, those guys just really kicked butt in 18. And then I started my own team, Team GPG, and came back in 19. And we took first, third, and fourth out of 80. So that was pretty cool, you know, to take my own team and, and do that. And then, you know, we've been doing other things as well. Um, shooting uh, exhibition shots out to four miles now. So that's kind of cool. We're doing that just for research and development to help us to learn how to shoot two miles better. There's a lot of things to learn about ELR, let me tell you. You know, it's not just developing a half minute load or better. It's understanding how to work together as a team having a sense of urgency for the wind, being able to be stable to spot properly and using good optics to spot. Um, and, you know, we went with the 416. When I did the TV show, a lot of people asked me, why, did you, why are you using the 416 Barrett? It was pretty easy. I was doing all the voiceovers for the uh, King, of two, two, King of Two Mile TV show. 
and it was it was obvious right away because on all the I watched everybody shoot like eight times, and when I saw Ronnie Wright from Barrett shoot his 416 M99, it was like a bus going down range. I mean, the trace was just a monster trace. And then when it hit, it just exploded rocks all around the hillside. And I was on lunch break. I called Derek Rogers and said, hey, man, we got to build a 416. I mean, it was evident right there. Just because of the trace and the impact was so much energy. The thing we didn't know is we didn't know whether or not the powders and the bullets would have low SDs because it was kind of an unknown. And lo and behold, the first rifles we got put together were single digit, single digit SDs. And we were having some crazy groups like, you know, I think Derek shot a two inch group at a thousand. I mean, just ridiculous. So we knew that once we could obtain the accuracy and the low SDs, certain deviations, we knew that we had something. And obviously in 19, we proved that. And then, you know, uh, Brantley was shooting a 416 also, so that was the top four guns were all 416 Barrett's with uh, cutting edge lasers. Right. So that's well, pretty much in a nutshell. I mean, I, um, I'm i really loving the ELR thing right now, and actually I'm going to build a – the only thing I haven't done yet as far as rifle goes is the uh, PRS game, and I, I'm supporting Swanee today. He's a local uh, Michigan shop owner now down in uh, – Swanee! Oakland. Yeah. Swanee! Um, so that's he was on the show. With, yeah, what, it's a gonna be a lot ago? of fun working with those guys, um, supporting that, and they're they're gonna start doing PRS and ELR builds and training in Central Michigan. So, you know, ELR is hard in Michigan. We don't have really a lot of places to shoot ELR. You know, ELR starts at fifteen hundred yards, generally speaking, and then we work out to two miles and beyond. So right now, it's hard to find a place like that in Michigan. But Swanee's got a hookup down there in central Michigan to where we can train and practice. And then you got uh, Tom Sarver down in Ohio that we can utilize his range too. So there's some pretty cool stuff happening over here in the Midwest. That's, re that's really awesome. It really sounds like ELR is just kind of like in a monster growing phase right now. You know, it's something you used to hear about, you know, a little here, a little there, but more and more stuff is popping up. Um, how, how can someone – you know, if someone's trying to get into it, how would they go about getting into ELR? Um, and when they get in, like, what distances could they expect to shoot? Sure. Well, I would suggest um, before you purchase anything, just because it's costing a lot of money, to go visit some matches and talk to some of the people that are finishing the top 10, top five. You know, pick their brains. You know, it's a very easygoing community. Uh, the course of fire, it's not like, you know, a long range championship for the NRA where you're shooting all day long and then the pits and then on the firing line, uh, you know, we only shoot like, you know, 15, 20, 30 rounds in a day. So our downtime is all day long. So it'd be very easy to visit a match um, and then just talk to the people that are finishing the top 10 and pick their brains and maybe see what you'd like. Um, a lot of the times too, if you show up a day before or whatever, it probably isn't a big deal to go out and actually shoot these guns. And a lot of people will let them, you know, let you shoot them and see how they feel and kind of look at your ballpark figure for how much you want to spend. But I would suggest going to a local match. We've got, you know, the NRA ELR national championships is in Indiana camp Atterbury We have the world's longest shot challenge. It's going to be out in Raton this year, but there's a lot of matches down in Texas. Also, you got a match down in Georgia. Um, and then obviously King of two mile, and then obviously right now, the ELR Nash, the, the uh, King of Two Mile events, I think we're like in six or seven different countries now. So you got France, Italy is making a match, Ukraine wants to make a match, Russia, Canada, USA, South America, and South Africa. So it's starting to really get big across the globe. Yeah, Paul, I mean, I, I remember sharing a, a couple of videos on the Shooter's Mindset. This was going back maybe a year or two, maybe a little bit more. It was some world record long range shot. I don't know the details and who did it. It might have been right. you, it might have been somebody else. I don't, I don't know. But to the general public eye on this long range and breaking records, they're like, right. You always hear this. Well, Carlos Havcock did it with yeah. a with a wood stock and nobody. Yeah. And you see, you know, people doing these world records. They got a team of ten right. people with video cameras and equipment, and they're how sure. many times did they shoot to make that shot? You right. got that type of crowd of folks. What do you say to those 
that type of crowd, I know it's probably never going to get through their head to understand. What you know, that's a, that's a great question. Do, I get but... that asked a lot. You know, the way that I want to describe it is this. Um, when we do our extreme long range shooting beyond two miles, we're doing research and development. There's no standard for that. I mean, you're just going to go out in the desert with your friends and you're trying to do things. You're trying to make shots just to see how applicable it is to, you know, to test the equipment and uh, see how, um, you know, how many times you can shoot and hit a target. I would say that that's called exhibition shooting. You know, we made a 3.4 mile shot and a four mile shot on a one minute of angle target or less. Two, we're two for two now, and it, but we would consider that an exhibition shot. We wouldn't consider that a world record. I would consider a world record where you have a, an event that's published to the community, a world record event, and there's a set of rules where everybody follows the same set of rules. And right now the standard for ELR world record is three for three cold war with no practice shots on a 36 inch plate. That's considered the world record. There's a couple different organizations right now. We're trying to work on that as a group to bring them all together to have like one organization or not. So there's a couple different people doing a couple different things, but the bottom line is that, you know, the King of Two Mile, the NRA ELR National Championships, ELR Central World Record Attempt, the 50 Caliber Suitors Association World Record Attempts, you know, those are the things that are publicly knowledge where you, there's a, a standard set of rules where you show up and you have the same set of rules, the same distances, same size plates, and relatively the same conditions, and then you go cold board three for three. That's what I consider a world record. Um, you know, if you shoot the farthest ever in a military environment, that might be a record for that situation, right? The longest sniper confirmed kill. Absolutely. It's a totally different environment, so totally different set of standards versus maybe somebody going to a civilian match with nobody shooting at you, right? right. So I, I think that they're, they're separate records and you have personal records too. That's okay. I, I think the biggest message here is to go have fun, um, you know, go out in the desert and do the exhibition shooting if you want to have fun. There's a milk jug challenge that Long Range Shooters of Utah puts on. It's a, it's a blast. And, uh, you know, there's other types of exhibition shooting that people do for their own personal behalf, which is fine. You know, obviously when we're doing ELR, I can't forget to mention safety, you know, knowing where, what land you're on, making sure you have permission, making sure you, that you're following the rules and then making sure, you know, obviously safety is huge. You're your, your target backstop and beyond. I can't stress that enough. Um, and then obviously, you know, when we get to be three and four miles away, you can't see it with a spotting scope. So you have to have a Ford observer, kind of like artillery. Well, you know, those things are dangerous too. So you need to be very cautious. And I highly recommend, you know, getting with other folks that have done it before to kind of learn out what they're doing and how they're doing it. We just don't want to have the wrong image and the wrong impression to the general public about what we're doing and, you know, having a, a situation where it could, you know, so here's, here's what, what I say doing. to the crowd. Here's what I say to the crowd. And it goes with every game, essentially. Technology evolves. Not only that, the athlete evolves. So you're going to have these records being broken with modern day equipment. I mean, you showed your rifle in the pre-show and I'm sure we'll get a chance to see it. I mean, the things you have on, I don't even know what it is. I don't know what, it, what that looks like. It's just in the way of your scope, right? right. But you, you this wasn't around this is new equipment you're obviously doing a lot of tne and testing for companies and it could i mean the, it seems like there's so much involved in prs shooting let alone elr shooting where it's like it's twice as complicated right as far I, as the math and the calculations and loading and equipment is more pricey to get into obviously so equipment obviously you can reach out and touch somebody with modern day equipment easier than you could years ago you know you know and um it's trickling down to the military too you know i did a training session with the army sniper unit before the nra national championship and we i did i worked with them for the day before and then the next day there was like three or four of them made their personal longest shots ever so this stuff is applicable to the military as well and there's a lot of stuff that you know they're joining forces and we're working together and all this equipment 
Um, I can tell you this in 19, in the 1990s, I was just messing around at a mile and 2000 yards with my 300 wind mag that I was shooting in the long range national championships at the time. And we were just going to have some fun. We were shooting a, a mile, you know, 1800 to 2000 yards. And I'd be lucky if I could hit a six by six target two or three times out of 10, you know, that was kind of where I was at back then today <clears throat> in testing. I've shot like 10 shots in a 12 inch ring at a mile. So there, there's a big difference in where we've came since the nineties to today. Yeah. And I think there's five people now, uh, myself and Derek and Bruno put from France, Duncan Davis from JJ rock and uh, Derek Rogers have hit five or two miles within five shots. So that really, I mean, within five shots at a target and putting an impact, that's pretty credible. And that's, yeah. that's, we're getting to the point now where, you know, it still remains to be seen on the point system and where we're going to go from here and how we're going to evolve. But you can see a progression from 2015 when the King of Two Mile first started till today. I mean, everybody's doing better and it's progressing and they're shooting farther and farther and they're getting more impacts on plates. Right. Can you say, I mean, obviously I wasn't in the military, but did you say the competition like ELR is a little bit more advanced than the military or they were just trying to catch up to them? Or can, obviously you can share some of your knowledge sure. with the folks in the military to help them well, get out that far. I think that the competitive civilian world right now are doing better. Um, there's some things that are involved that obviously you can't really compare a person sitting on a firing line in a match, you know, eating hot dogs and drinking beers, you know, I mean, yeah. when you're getting shot at, it's a totally different situation. So you really can't compare the two, but as far as just pure accuracy and putting rounds on target, <clears throat> you know, we're using, we're using match rifles, right? So we got single shot bolt action rifles, 40 inch barrels, <clears throat> you know, um, there, there's the weight restrictions up to like 40 pounds now. So it's probably not something the military snipers are going to run around the jungle yeah. with right. <clears throat> special yeah. optics, custom loads, custom chambers, lathe turn bullets. There's all the stuff that we're using. that's custom that the regular military soldiers probably not going to have. So with that being said, you know, it's really not a fair comparison. However, we're starting to see a blend of, you know, military snipers competing in these events. And we're seeing a lot of these companies that are doing R&D to develop these systems for the military. They're getting better and better. So it's all coming together. And I think we're all getting better um, on both sides of the house. So talking about the ELR matches. Um, um, Jen, you got anything again? Yeah, yeah, you had a little bit of a lag there. But um, I, I'm used to PRS matches, so I kind of know the format and I know when you show up kind of what to expect. We have like 20 stages. Usually we get the book the day we get there the day before and we, right. you know, go get set up and we chrono and get our zero and get our data and use our Kestrel and get all set up. And the next day we have 20 stages, kind of know where you're going to go and you move from one to the next and just kind of keep shooting. So what's sure. the format like in ELR? Because I've heard it's very different sure. and it's a little slower paced. Um, yeah. and, and is it where you shoot the whole match or is it elimination or how does that work? Yeah. So you, they do a, we do a random draw, <clears throat> you basically scramble your names up in a computer and we have a squatting list for when you're going to shoot. <clears throat> um, generally the day before you'll have a chance to come and get a hundred yards zero. So I'll just, I'll just kind of take you guys through this real quick. So we use a lab radar to get our velocities the day before. Once we get the velocities, we program it into our, our Kestrels and our 701s to give us our solutions. And what I do is I use the Kestrel and also I use AB Analytics with my computer and they're two separate engines and I'll put all the data into those engines. And if they come up and they're within a quarter minute of angle, I know that they're, they're good to go. If I only had one, I wouldn't really know if it was, if I made a mistake with entering the data probably the biggest thing people make mistakes is not entering the proper data and keeping it up to date as the temperature gets warmer or your velocities are changing. You know, th those are at two miles. It's a huge, I mean, you can miss by 20, 30 feet. So the day before we get our velocities, we enter all of our 
um, data. We have usually two or three range finders that are provided uh, by the match directors. We get all the targets, the directions of fire, the inclination, the range, and then we'll do little sketches and stuff to you know get all our plot cards ready. So we're building our data. We're building all of our plot cards for our, our competition the next day. If you're not doing this, you should be because it's very helpful. Also, what we're doing is we're laying down in positions on the firing line and we're kind of going through our course of fire so that where our positions and everything, we're getting familiarized with what we need for rear bags or bipods or mats or whatever we need to do to, to make the angles for firing. And then also just transitioning, getting used to know where the plates are. And then um, we might go through a short, brief, little team building thing where we're kind of going through a mock um, match to kind of get our, you know, our hand and arm signals or our commands, what have you down. And then really that's about it. The next morning we'll get ready and then they'll, they'll go through the one through 80. Well, they might go through one through 40 the first day. And then depending on weather, if it's inclement weather or something, they might chop it off at 30 or 50. And then the next day for qualification, they'll finish up maybe 40 through 80. And then on the third day for the King of Two Miles, we'll have finals where they, I think they take the top 10 was like the first three years. And then now they're doing, I think like um, maybe top 15% or something like that. I think we had 15 or 16 last year out of 80. So that's pretty much how you do it. The targets go from 1,500 to 2,000, 2,300 yards the first day for qualification. And the way that works is you have plates and you start out at the closest plate first, which is 1500. <clears throat> you have to hit the plate at least one time to advance. If you don't advance, you're done. And the point systems have changed over the years, but the way that used to be is the first shot was the most points. It's five times multiplier. So at 1500 yards would be five times 1500 and then four times 1500 and so on. And then if you hit the plate, one of those five times, then you can transition to your next plate, which is around a mile. And then it's only three shots. And then you have to hit one out of three, at least to advance to the next plate, which is around 18, 1900 yards. And then you have to hit one of those out of those three to get advanced to the 2000 or 2200 yard plate. They vary every year. They change the plates so that it keeps everybody, you know, scrambling for their elevations and zeros or whatnot. So essentially, you know, your points are tabulated after everybody qualifies, and then they take the top 10 or 15 to go to the finals. And then the finals, you start out around 25 to 2,800 yards, and then 3,000 yards, and then, you know, 3520 for two miles or 3550 or whatever. So that's how it's ran the last couple, two, three years. Very, very difficult. You know, it's much harder than it looks. Um, probably a lot like PRS too, you know, some some of these shooters probably make it look really easy. Mm -hmm. But when you're up there, you know, fumbling around with your gear, and that's why I practice, you know, just like anything else, you know, if you practice a lot and become one with your gun, whether you're manipulating it, since uh, time management's huge in ELR, just because the wind changes so rapidly and we're shooting so far that if you wait, at all, you're probably going to miss the target. So the teams that are very well-oiled machines, they have a very fast sense of urgency and they're getting short commands. They generally do better. Well, we got some live ones here that trickled in. What do we got? Yeah. So uh, Swanee and George both want to know, uh, they want us to ask you how many shooters hit the two mile target? Uh, in total history, five. Wow. Yeah, That's so a, myself, Derek Rogers, Bruno Put from France, Robert Brantley, and uh, Derek Rogers. I think Mitch Fitzpatrick hit one at another event, World's Longest Shot, but as far as I know, it's either five or six shooters is all within five shots, though. It's within five shots. Gotcha. So if you sit there and take time and shoot it in 20, it, still don't, it doesn't count. Right. I think that if they were to, and it's up to the match directors, I think that if they were to increase it to 10 shots, we'd have a little bit better probability. But, you know, I mean, it's challenging to do it within five shots, right? And they're trying to look at practicality. 
Right. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. I mean, I and I think say me it. and Dun- me and Duncan Davis with JJ Rock, I think we're the only ones to hit on our second shot. I think, I think one of my favorite things about King of Two Mile last year was watching my friend Jacqueline, who was pregnant, take her boppy oh, yeah. pillow and lay down and rock it. Yeah, she really did awesome. Mm-hmm. And it's great to see, you know, she really she really kicked butt. I will say this too, you know, a lot of times in, in the award ceremonies and on social media, I don't think anybody does it on purpose, but a lot of times people say that Robert Brightland's the king of two mile or Paul Phillips the king of two mile. What well, really is, it's a team sport. So my teammates are Derek Rogers and Mark Lonsdale. And I, I couldn't have done what I did without their help. So it really is a team match. A lot of times we glorify the one shooter that's on the gun, but it really is. It takes the whole team. So, you know, when we talk about King of Two Mile, it's the team that wins the match. It's, you know, the spotter and the win guy. I mean, they all have to be doing their part. If any one person doesn't do their part, you won't win and you won't hit the target. Oh, there we go. Any more live or are we good? So uh, George Gardner asked um, kind of clarification. You want to know how many people hit the two mile target last year? Zero. Oh. Yeah, there was zero hits. There was three hits in 18. Me, Robert Brantley, and Duncan Davis. I think the conditions were a little better. They were a little bit more calmer and stable. Um, Last year, we had some funky tailwinds coming in. And I think it was giving us some updrafts. And we had a lot of elevation. Um, My team almost hit. We were like within one foot two times in a row. But there was just a lot of conditions. It It was hard. So I think from year to year, it's going to be dependent on conditions. You know, extreme long ranges, we're talking two miles. So if you have some tailwinds, we're, and then in, in, in Raton, we're basically shooting up, up into mountains. So if that tailwind is going up into the mountains, you have these huge gusts. And when you're up there setting targets up, I mean, you can feel it. It just blows you right off the hill. So it's difficult. And then depending on when you get squatted to shoot, it can make all the difference in the world. If you're yeah. in the morning when it's dead calm and all the vegetation is just laying right down and the grass is staying still, and you don't feel nothing on your face, you got to turn and burn. If you get unlucky and get afternoon draw, you know, it can affect you. You know, it's just, it's the nature of the beast, you know, whenever you get called up to shoot. Yeah, I know in PRS, um, you know, we typically have one or two long range, long range stages. Um, that'll be stretched out over a thousand, at least at the matches around here. And yeah. the, the whole way of gaming the system is if you could figure out how to get on a squad that's going to shoot one of those stages first thing in the morning, mm-hmm. um, right. you, you definitely <laughs> have a huge advantage, you know, shooting your, your 1300 yard shot at 7 a.m. versus 2 p.m. Sure. Well, you know, in shooting sports my entire career, it's always been a factor when you've been squatted. You know, like an F class, if you get squatted in the morning, generally it's pretty calm. You know, if you, and if you have to go to the fifth or sixth relay, by the time you get up there, you have 10 and 15 mile an hour gust. Well, you've just lost like five to 10 points right there. And whether or not you make them up, you know, if you get lucky and get a good relay again, it's just up to the uh, luck of the draw and the wind. Um, obviously, we, if you guys have been listening, he just won. The King of Two Mile. Can you tell us a little bit about that match and how you beat you beat Robert Brantling, who was a reigning king? Yeah, so um, you know, we came off a of 2017 King of Two Mile with me and Amel and Derek uh, on TV. That was pretty cool. It was a it was a pretty awesome memory. And you know, we had been shooting together for a long time. You know, being on the U.S. Rifle Team for 10 to 15 years and shooting national championships together. So you know, we, we had our communication down and our strategy down. Um, it's pretty interesting, the fact that PRS shooters now are melting into a discipline that F-class shooters are involved in. So it's kind of a neat little rivalry, um, kind of cool. And then I, Robert Brantley, I think he coached in 17, um, if I remember correctly, see him on TV. But So I had been in discussion with Tom Manners, and they were building 416s, and we had talked preseason. I knew they were really getting their stuff together. And obviously Robert, you know, is an exceptional shooter. 
one of the things I, you know, I see that Robert does, you know, he's out there pulling the trigger every weekend. You know, you can't beat that. You know, trigger time on these rifles is priceless. Um, and that's what he's doing. He's shooting a lot. He's got a lot of trigger time. So for them, you know, building the 416s with a good bullet, uh, the cutting edge laser, and, you know, they worked hard developing that those guns. And then they were just really well working together, you know, at a good rhythm. And this particular last year, you know, we made, we both made it to the finals. And, you know, we, I think, uh, yeah, we both hit the first plate. I think he had two impacts on the first plate. And I had two, one impact. And then I had two impacts at the second plate, which just edged me over him. So really, I mean, it was, it could have went either way with the top five. You know, it was so close for points. But one of the things with ELR is, you know, you get the most points for hitting the targets the farthest away. Now, mm -hmm. in two years ago, they just changed the point system to where where it was before. It didn't count as much. But now, the farther targets count way more. So, yeah, it was, um, you know, they're a great team. It's going to be a rivalry going to France this year in May. Um, you know, Robert's going to go out there. We're going to go out there. And uh, it's going to be a battle. And then, obviously, in June – Again, for 2020, it's going to be a it's going to be a great match. They're going to have 100 shooters this year at King of Two Mile in USA, so it's going to be pretty cool. Um, nice. Those guys are definitely, I think, you know, one of the teams to beat. You know, they 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 practice a lot, they shoot a lot, and uh, they got a good program over there. And especially now with George, you know, with having all the gunsmithing there, and then with Tom with the stocks and Robert shooting they're going to be a hard team to beat. Um, there you go, Jen, you got anything on your end? So we, you kind of alluded to it a little bit uh, a few minutes ago, but King of Two Mile is a, a team sport, very much so. So yeah. how does that work? Um, and how did your team work together? It includes spotters, yeah. I know, that really yeah. help the shooter to get on target. So sure. how does that work? Because I know you couldn't do that individually. So Right. So, you know, with my competitive background, you know, on the U.S. rifle team and also Team McMillan winning, you know, lots of national championships, we've developed, you know, kind of a goal setting. You know, the beginning of the year we set goals and we, we talk as a team to how we're going to achieve those goals. Well, one of the things me and Derek and Mark talked about was we were going to the new 416s, so we had to have time on the guns to learn how they shoot and ch check our loads and test our bullets you know, to make sure that they were transitioning through trans and sub speeds fine. And uh, once we determined that, we needed to work on our teamwork. So we went out in the desert and we practiced two or three times um, together as a team. We're doing sim simulated matches, you know, practicing the time management and practicing all the skill sets. And where do we, where do we place the spotter? Um, and how do we set up our, you know, our spotting scope? You know, one of the things that we, learned was that um this guy here you know i discovered that the ability to pick up trace and see mirage and see spots was was huge with the swarovski btx 95 again it's a lot of money a lot of technology but you know it's going to help you you know that was one of the things we discovered by our practices so we went ahead and got these and you know we set up behind the shooters the spotter sets up behind the shooters so he can pick up the trace and the impact and then we have another guy that's up close to the shooter that gives commands and helps out with double checking the zeros and making sure the knobs go good. And, uh, you know, just working together as a team, you know, a well-oiled machine. And again, the sense of urgency is critical because the wind's always changing. You know, it's not like you're shooting a four minute target at 500 yards. I mean, we're, you know, we're live and die by one mile per hour wind changes and, <laughs> and uh, velocity changes. Now this year, we're going to have to do the whole thing over again because the King of two mile, they changed it from three man to two man. So it's going to be a totally different setup. So Derek and I will be continuing on for team GPG and we're going to have to practice the two man setup and we're going to have to figure out what, what works better for us. Um, and we're just going to have to practice that before King of two mile. France is still going to keep the three man team set up and they're going to let them, you know, figure it out in the next couple of years, their equipment, but um, you know, just practicing, you know, just practicing and practicing within the standard. 
you don't just go out and shoot groups at 100 yards in the desert. You set up steel at the same distance as you're going to be shooting in a competition. You put yourself on the clock because that's the only way you're going to learn all those little things that you don't know about until you run into them. You know, problems will show themselves and you, you're keeping good notes and your team notes and, you know, working through that stuff. We videotape our practices too. Maybe there's something we, we missed that we see on a videotape. So that's kind of how we, we go about doing things. You know, we're very professional and we um, make a goal and we train to standard and, and hopefully if we've done everything proper, you know, when we get the opportunity with a good condition, we can put a lot of points on the board and, and uh, if we're good enough that day, we'll win. Now, where are these facilities that you can go and practice at these extreme distances? Cause I know some states, maybe on the East Coast, you don't have yeah. that luxury, especially just to show up. There's one thing if they're going to set up a match there. They're sure. just going to show up and say, hey, I'm going to shoot four right. miles today, folks. Well, that's kind of something we're working on right now as a whole. A lot of different people are putting things together. ELRcentral.com has got ranges around the country that you can visit there. Also, matches around the country. Um, we're actually – that's something we're discussing right now as far as organizers. I organize the NRA ELR National Championship. And I'm trying to get with all the other organizers so we can come together to have like a one-stop shop warehouse Facebook page or website where all this stuff can be learned, where to go shoot, where to go train, what the rules are. You know, there's there are some facilities all over uh, Thunder Valley Precision down in Ohio with Tom Sarver. There's ranches in Texas, um, out in Arizona, Nevada. I mean, they're all over the place. It's just, you know, again, like I said before, you know, you have to get permission and understand, you know, what you're doing. But that's one of the things, because of ELR is such a fast growing sport, there's a need for people to know where to shoot, where to train. And we're trying to put that together so that it'll make it much easier for someone to get involved and learn and have a place to train. Oh, there we go. What do we got, Greg? Anything? Uh, Swanee wants to know what about bipod changes? There's the structured barrel. That's so cool. <laughs> um, bipod changes. Yeah, so before before we had the um, the rule of Phoenix bipod, which this is a what you use on an FTR class rifle, um, 308 with a front bipod and rear rest. That was kind of that's still the current rules right now for the U.S. shooting team, the U.S. rifle team. Um, this is for the FTR rifle. This is a very common bipod. We won many world championships with this. We were using this in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. Well, just recently, just King of Two Mile, they made a rule change of the tactical bipod. They have to use tactical bipods now. And we're still kind of learning what the rules are going to be. It's going to be no wider than eight inches. Um, fully collapsed. So we're, you know, this is a KDEX bipod I'm testing right now, but I'm not sure what I'm going to use. I, I'm not really familiar with the PRS guys. are probably going to have a huge head start on us with this, but that, a that lot rifle of, looks giant and that, I, that bipod looks so small on that, that yeah. rifle. I, you know, I'm not going to change the rules for NRA match. I'm going to keep it the same because it's a 40 pound rifle. Well, well, actually we can have up to 50 pound rifles in NRA but we're not going to get up and run with them and fold the bipod and run through the jungle, right? So I don't know. It is um, it is what it is. You know, the people that want to compete in King of Two Mile will have to use these folding bipods. So they'll have to, you know, change over and, and utilize their rule set. So I've shot with these. They work They work fine. Um, they don't have that fine-tune adjustment like the, uh, the Phoenix does. There's a little wheel, and you just turn it, and it gives you micro-adjustments. So if somebody could come up with a micro adjustment for these things, that'd be kind of cool. They also make little the sleigh feet for these. So it's just King of Two Mile right now that made that rule change. Um, I have, we'll have to wait and see what the masses say for the future of this. You know, it's kind of a controversial topic right now. You know, the bigger teams that are gonna, they'll do whatever they need to do to, to compete, they'll do. Um, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to try these different bipods and see what works better just because I'm not familiar with these little guys, these big, big 40 pound rifles. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, Paul, I got to ask you this. I have no idea. I know it's probably a number that I can't afford, but your current setup, all right, What are, if you were to throw a number out there, what are we looking at for something like that? Hmm, <laughs> probably around. Like, can I buy a couple cars? No, no, no. It's no? probably around eight to 10,000. Okay, that's, that's less Somewhere than Somewhere in there. Maybe okay. 12, you know, I mean, depending on how much your gunsmith charges, yeah. You know, if you have somebody, good friend, George Gardner, that could build you one for cheap. <laughs> yeah. But um, somewhere around that ballpark, you know, you, it's no different than the other rifle. You got about $1,000 into the stock, 1000 to 1200 into the stock, 2000 to $2,500 in the action, $1,000 in the barrel by the time you get done doing the reamer and the chamber and the, the whether you use a, um, a brake or a suppressor. Um, and then optics, you know, obviously that could vary from one to four grand. And then, you know, your trigger. And if you need the, if you need the extra elevation, you know, a lot of people, they run on elevation with their scopes, especially the rifles like 338 Lapua, 300 Norma, 33 XC, and the the thirty the three three enabler, you know, those probably would need a Charlie. This basically just it's like a prism that changes your view, and it could give you up to eight hundred minutes of angle. So that if you're running out of elevation with your scope tube, you put one of these on, it gives you more elevation. And then for the extreme long range stuff that we do, once you get to about fifteen to twenty degrees, your scope vision through the trolley runs into your barrel. So then we have the delta, which just deflects it off the side of the barrel. See that? That's, that's cool. That's gnarly. That's a, yeah, that's yeah. Just, having, just having that, just having that barrel pointed pointed at you is like the viewfinder. There, you can take it all the way up to you know maximum distance. So for the four sixteen Barrett, it's somewhere around five and a half miles. Yeah. Wow. Greg, you got any? Uh, you got a question off the notes there? Yeah. Um, so you, you've thrown out all these these different distances, these impressive shots. Um, what's your your personal record right now? Well, my team with James DeVoglier and uh, Derek Rogers, the farthest we ever shot was seven thousand seventy yards as a team. Wow. My personal behind the trigger was 3.4 miles, 6,012 yards. But, you know, I don't really look at it as a personal. I mean, it takes a team. Actually, it takes more than a team. It takes a crew. I mean, you got to have four observers watching. Every, I mean, you really, I really, it, it takes the whole group. It really does. You got to have the four observers watching to see Splash to direct you in. Your guys that are watching wind and keeping on it and spotting the safety guys looking out for anybody in the area. I mean, there, it takes a whole, the guys on the camera, we had Alex Kordsman with his 11 mile camera that came in and hooked it out. You couldn't do these things without all the support and, and help. It would be really difficult. You know, four miles, that's you know, 23 yeah. seconds time of flight. Wow. And I think out of, I don't know, I think maybe out of a hundred or 120 shots through three days, I think I might have seen one or two splashes just because it made a big, big poof. But other than that, there's no way you can see that far. So, yeah. That's but great. I think, you know, for ELR, I think my, me personally, my favorite event or favorite thing that happened to me was, was probably spotting for Derek in 17 on TV. That was crazy. I mean, never been on TV before, you know, shooting. That's kind of cool. And to be able to win a match, you know, on TV, that's pretty neat. But mm -hmm. for me, for coaching him, do you see his spots? And then he's, you know, we call him Machine Gun Derek. You know, he's a reigning world champion in F-Class. Um, you know, just an awesome shooter. And it's just, you know, nice to be teamed up with that kind of a person like that that can shoot so awesome. George Gardner says, what he's trying to say is it takes a lot of rounds and a lot of luck. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you could say that, but my argument to him would be 
finishing first, first, third, and first in the last four years, I don't think that's luck. I think that's skill. He also said uh, to tell you that George says Diet Coke tastes real good. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, we have a rematch this year, and hopefully, hopefully we'll have more people hit two miles. I bet George that someone was going to hit two miles, and we it didn't work. So I had to buy him a Diet Coke. But hopefully this year we'll have more more teams hitting two miles because ultimately that's what it's all about right it's about fun and learning and you know i really root for everybody when they're up there you know i want to see them be successful and hit that plate because it's it's a lot of fun and once you do it's it's addicting coke zero definitely tastes better than diet coke yeah coke zero is better or diet George. dr pepper I like yeah, keep up Dr. with Pepper. the modern times. Keep up with the modern times. It's Coke Zero now. It's like the the, the Diet Coke just fading away. Is Coke George don't going want to France? It. George, are you going to France? What do we got as far as anything anything else live? If not, we'll get back to George. If not, we got seven, right? Nothing else live right now. So oh, seven. Okay. Here's the. I know you shoot for GSL. Here's a 416 GSL can. That's the Copperhead. Well, that was one of my questions I was about to ask is, um, you and I both shoot for McMillan stocks, yep. which are awesome stocks. Um, so what else, tell us all the specs of your rifle. So I see the GSL can. Oh yeah. And we know the McMillan stock, but what else are the parts? So, yeah. Night, Night Force sure, no glass, problem. which you have too. So obviously I'm sponsored by Night Force. You know, I'm a long time shooter for them. Um, they've been really good to me and they, we won a lot of championships and, and uh, you know, we're going to stay with what works, you know? Um, so I got the McMillan beast one. I think this is the first stock off the press, I think, or the first or second. And I've just stayed with it because it's been so awesome. <clears throat> I'm using the bat machine, 50 caliber action. It's a single shot. And what's nice about this is that you can shoot 370, just get a different bolt face, 375 bolt face. And you run 375 shy tack or a shy tack improved. And then you can do 416, 408, 460 styre or 50 cal or you know i run the 416 barrett but you, there's a lot of options with the setup so all you need to do is just get a different barrel on the bolt you can pretty much run anything you want and you'll are um I, mean, I always use bart lines been using bart lines for more than 10 years now on my f class rifles and elr rifles um this particular one is it's a it's a honker man it's 1.9 inches at the breech and it continues all the way down i think to 1.8 at 38 inches this particular one is the structured barrel that I'm testing for TACOM HQ, the same people that make the Charlie and the Delta. Um, the philosophy is, is that it's lightened up, it's, it's stiffer, you have more radius for cooling, so you don't have all that mirage coming off your barrel up in the front of your scope. And then, you know, you have these holes that are cut in there for cooling purposes. And also, the recoil with this barrel is just way different. It's, it just seems like it's more manageable and it seems like it's a little calmer so when you shoot it it's just you know it just comes right straight back and forward so you can get back on your target again you don't have to like wrestle with the rifle to try to find the target again so still testing it, it, it so far so good it's also got air holes each each um hole it's down the tube here it's got little air holes to relieve pressure um and then very cool the triggers, I'm sponsored by Bullet Central with the, tech, with the um, Bixinated triggers. My longtime buddy, Alex Sitman, has been betting all my stocks for 10 or 15 years. I mean, I really, you know, there's, there's people that talk a lot about betting and not betting, but I firmly believe that some of my success, if not most of it's come from Alex. A lot of times we tear these rifles down when we travel to France and I can't haul a six foot long thing in a case. So I have to break everything down, the action, the barrel. And I have a custom Pelican with all these inserts with hard foam so that when someone drops it, 
you know, it won't just like come through the case. So when you're tearing these apart and putting them back together, if you have a really good bed job, you know, you'll hold zero. When I went, I've probably taken this rifle apart and put it back together probably 20 or 30 times. And every single time, you know, I'm within a quarter minute of angle or less of my 100 yard zero. So that's a really big deal, especially if you don't have time to even zero. Um, we always use the Holland levels that come from F class. We learned that canting has a huge effect. <clears throat> Obviously, you know, we're using the uh, cutting edge bullets, Barrett brass, <clears throat> Vitivery powder, applied ballistics solutions, the Kestrel lab radar. And the one thing I haven't mentioned is, you know, with ELR for organizing events and practicing, you gotta have one of these. It's a target vision camera. These things go out to two miles and beyond. It's really, I mean, it's a requirement, you know, just like the lab radar, the Kestrel and the camera, it's just something you have to have, whether you're practicing or putting on matches. You know, we've learned that spotters through spotting scopes doesn't work, you know, or even hit indicators. At the NRA National Championships this year, we had hit indicators and we had several that would flash, but they weren't hits because we'd rewind the video and, and it was nothing there. So you know how they hit hit dirt in front and splash and mm -hmm. you know, you have ones that go by that gives false hits. So actually I got so frustrated, I said, just take them off and we'll use the cameras. So that's kind of a match director decision thing, you know. I mean, it's kind of cool to see the for the spectators and stuff, and also the shooters to see the the light flash. But we had a lot of ones that went off prematurely. It could have been setup error. I know those are kind of finicky. Those settings on those. Um, let's see. What if I forgot anybody here? I'm trying the Accutech bipod, the Cadex bipod. I'm using the T5 brake uh, when I'm shooting a lot of rounds. And then I've used these for like only like uh, world record attempts or when I'm shooting low rounds. We're going to try to figure out how to maybe Coltec could help us out with a cover for one of these. Maybe a PRS guys could help me out too. But we're trying to figure out ways to keep this thing a little cooler. Um, Coltec does make a pretty sweet cover. I think, uh, Jen, is that what you have in your GSL? Yeah, it's downstairs because my gun's in pieces, but yeah. Oh, let's we'll see if I've got anybody here. Um, yeah. Big, big similarities yeah, between your, it, you know? your and um, Jen's gear. That's impressive. Yeah. So Jen's, are, Jen's already like on top. She already got all the top shit. <laughs> yeah. Like Midland stocks, Night Force glass, Coltex thing, GSL suppressors. I mean, what? What we're doing now is I started. I, you know, there's a lot of people that are doing it all around the country. They started a, a 338 and below class so that people that are, you know, not wanting to buy these mammoth things, you know, it costs a lot of money to shoot, you know, somewhere between like six, eight, ten dollars a shot, you know. Um, and not only that, but, you know, barrel life, maybe only 800 rounds. You have to get a new pipe. So it's not like PRS where you're shooting thousands and thousands of rounds without rebarreling, but, um, so anyway, the 338 and below class, so you got 300 Norma, uh, you know, you got the, all the um, uh, 338 Lapua, the Improvers, the 33XC, the Enabler, uh, the Nosler, all those bullets are going to be a great combination that a lot of people already have them for long range hunting. So really what we're trying to do is incorporate all those long range hunters having an avenue for them to come in and maybe shoot a match before they go hunting or something, you know, have a little fun, get some zeros and participate and, and hopefully it'll grow in that realm. I'd like to see all the hunters get involved with their long range hunting rigs. I know that Jeff Brozovich with long range only is big into it. And he's been a great help and proponent to kind of bring that element together to the, the ELR game. There we go. Any upcoming events, projects or goals for you, Paul? 2020 what you got <clears throat> yeah so we have um we have the king of two mile france in may the king of two mile usa in june and i think the king of two mile canada is going to be in august i think i could be wrong robert furlong is heading up that one um you know the famous canadian sniper really good guy mm -hmm. and um i'm not really sure on the south america 
and South Africa events. We'll, we'll have to get that information out when it comes, but they're up and coming. They're starting to develop their programs and um, kind of excited to maybe go down and shoot one of those. It's kind of a long journey, but, and then there's a lot of new organizations starting up that if you go to ELR Central or 50 Keller Street Association, you read up on all these new organizations or, you know, frequent my website, Global Precision Group. Uh, we'll be putting out some informationals too. Um, there we go. What else we got here? Greg, you got anything? Yeah. So I was kind of wondering, I think we touched on this a little bit earlier, but I know that caliber choice is always a big thing in any, any different kind of shooting sport. Um, I know you said you're shooting the 416. Um, what were kind of the biggest factors making you choose that? Yeah, so when I did the TV show, I was doing the color commentary, and I watched everybody shoot like eight times. And when I saw Ronnie Wright from Barrett, he took second in 2016. And I saw his 416 bullet, and it looked like a bus going down range. And then when it hit, it just destroyed the hillside. So for us, it was the ability to see the trace and have energy – the 416 Barrett has twice the energy of a 375 shot attack at two miles. So that's gonna give you more of a statistical chance to see something move to where you can adjust to try to hit the plate. That's that's the philosophy for me. Um, the 375 shot attack though is an awesome round. It's a little bit less expensive, I think, to load. And um, you get a little bit more life out of the brass. And it's still very, very accurate and very competitive. And I think, so there's been three impacts at two miles with 416s and I think two with 375 shy attacks. So they're right there. I mean, they're both very, very well. And, you know, you have a whole gamut, you know, the enablers are coming out. David Tubbs XC rounds, he's got the 33, the 37, and now the 41, which is a 416. Um, you got a lot of different things coming out that are going to be very competitive. And, you know, this is all great for the sport, right? Competition. It's causing all these world-class shooters and world-class gunsmiths to really utilize their innovation and their brains to come up with stuff that's going to be more performance. And ultimately, we'll have a trickle-down effect to the military and, and uh, you know, they'll have better performing rifles. Um, what do we got? We heard uh, heard you're shooting with our friend Ray this year. Um, what is the part time in King of Two Mile? Say that one more time. You're shooting with Ray this year. Uh, what is the part time in King of Two Mile this year? He was saying, do you think you sh that that you can get Ray up to par and ready for King of Two Mile? Oh. Ray Gross. I should read the whole question. That's probably I, I'm not sure who you're talking about. Ray. Gonna Ray we Gross? talked about her on the pre-show that you're going to shoot with Ray. Oh, with that Ray. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I thought you were talking about Ray Gross. Ray Gross used my rifle won an NRA championship at the 33 XC. I thought you were talking about him. The other Ray. Yeah. Nine dolls. Yeah. Yeah. So she was reaching out to me. She was really interested in ELR. And I talked to her at a shot and I said, hey, you know what? I'd love to be able to come and I'll let you shoot my rifle, my ammo, and I'll just coach you. And then you can just try it out and see what you like and just see what you think of it. And uh, so I'm really excited about that. You know, it's kind of – and then I'm also, you know, kind of getting in with Swanee and, and the PRS guys. And I'm excited to, you know, get into PRS and shoot and kind of, uh, you know – working with all the different people that are doing that and, you know, get new friends and I'm excited about it. I think that, um, I think that people initially are a little intimidated because of the size of the rifle and the noise of the, uh, of the blast. But once they shoot it, I mean, it's like a, it feels like a mild 308 because it's so heavy. It doesn't have a lot of recoil. It's very light. So it's very easy to shoot and you're not having to carry it and run around like you do in PRS. So, it's pretty easy. Just lay on your belly and squeeze the trigger. Yeah. You know, I, funny story. I wasn't going to share this, but I think I will. 
Um, a couple of years ago, I took my, my father, he was 80, 80, he was 80 years old, he's a former Marine. He never competed in his entire life. And I put him on my 338 Lapua and he actually beat Brian Litz and Dave Tubb at the nationals. So, you know, I mean, a lot of people can do it. It's not that hard. I think that just goes to show you that the spotter and the guy that's reading the wind, and as long as you have a guy pulling the trigger, they can really do well together, but it takes all three. Boom. There we go. Any live ones before we wrap this one up? I think we're good. Yeah, I think we're good. 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 All right. We'll wind this one here down to shout outs, man. Impressive show. Man, a lot to soak in as far as a long range shooting thing. I don't know if I'm going to be getting into that. I'll definitely step foot, if anything, in PRS before I touch. And, well, it kind of makes sense to kind of go that route a little bit before you even touch the, the, the extreme long range stuff. But shout out, Scrake, what do you got? I have a shooters and sharp. Sh- yep, shooters and sharp shooters of Augusta, our local ranges here in Augusta. Overwatch Defense for an awesome Cerakote job. PDC Custom for a really sweet rifle chassis. NDZ Performance to build your uh, ultimate Gucci Glock on the uh, on the cheap cheap. Uh, phone Scope which would be uh, pretty cool for some ELR stuff. Uh, Shooter's World Propellant, um, Hunter's HD Gold for some real cool glasses, and Vortec. Vortec, Jen, what do you got? Yep, Prime Ammunition for awesome ammo. McMillan Stocks for these beautiful stocks you can get. GSL Suppressors, Night Force Optics, Warren Scope Mounts, Under Industries for your jerseys, um, Shooters of Augusta and Sharpshooters of Augusta, uh, phone scope and Spartan Precision Rifle, who just chambered me up some six GTs. So those are sitting at my FFL for me to go pick up my action. Yep. Nice. I'm gonna shout out to RCBS. I use all RCBS to load my stuff, and uh, cryptic clothing, crosstack mats, and Edgewood rear bags. There we go. A couple of shout outs to my and definitely subscribe to the channel. We put these on YouTube right after the live stream. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, right below yellow subscribe button, hit that every Tuesday, 9 p.m. Eastern. We're doing a new episode of the Shooter's Mindset. Uh, Tandem Cross for all your rimfire needs. Total opposite worlds here. Uh, you can check out Tandem Cross for the rimfire stuff. Uh, if you want to email me, the Shooter's Mindset at gmail.com is a good way to do that. Definitely thanks, Paul, for sharing a lot of his knowledge here on episode 282 of the Shooter's Mindset. And lastly, Rise Armament for some great ARs and AR-15 parts. Uh, that'll do it for episode 282. Thank you guys for tuning in tonight. We'll catch you on the next one. Thanks, oh, I guys. Got, I forgot I got to end it.